Welcome to episode 21 of the Eventual Knits podcast. My name is Leah. I am known as Miss LJV, Miss underscore LJV on Instagram and as Eventual on Ravelry. Today is Friday, February 7th, and it's, um, I think it was a pretty good weather day. Like it, it, um, I feel like the last several days have like started out kind of chilly in the morning, like the teens, um, Fahrenheit, and then get up to like maybe mid to high 20s, which, um, it's like after it gets cold, the mid 20s is definitely like fine to be sweatshirt weather if we wanted. Um, because I'm walking around campus a lot, I do wear a jacket still, but get hot and sweaty really fast. It's so funny the difference a temperature can make. Um, I apologize right now if you can hear my cat who is probably snoring, like kind of wheezing because he is sleeping. Um, this is Nero, Habanero. It's been a, it's, it's been a minute since I have podcasted, not for lack of wanting to, but life has been pretty intense lately. Um, I feel like I was very blasé about like work stress since starting this job. So I started working at the, at a, the Big Ten University that I work at on um, the University of Minnesota. Uh, in June and for a while my life was pretty not super stressful like in some ways there was a pretty steep learning curve but in other ways there is no such thing in my opinion um, as steep of a learning curve as teaching is it's like no matter even if you go do st after student teaching like nothing there's nothing can prepare you for having your own classroom and so it was like kind of a little intense at times, but really wasn't bad overall. And I just really got used to like it not being so bad, not having just like a constant base level of stress um, where it's just like coursing through you. And I got, I got it back <laughs> in January. Um, that really big project finally like was coming due and I mean literally you guys like the Friday at four o'clock before this last week before I did like my first experience with real participants like not not um a full class just like seven people um and a full class will be like 20 but I still needed to have everything ready to go and even as late as four o'clock on Friday I was getting emails with changing like like important like big steps in the process changing and so then I'd have to, I had to go and change it in my training and I had to remember and learn it and oh my god it's just it's been rough this last week especially with my sleep not good but um I got through the uh got through the class and for I mean you know a couple weeks I'm gonna be teaching this a lot <laughs> um, or it sounds like up to five times this spring semester slash summer I mean that's six hours a week so we'll see I'm not really concerned about the teaching it. It's about just like big changes and there's so much to remember with this product. Like it's a really cool product, um, but it's, it's complex and so much to remember. But after this week, I actually feel a lot better. Um, I, I still feel really drained. Like teaching for three hours straight, man, is a lot of energy for someone like me who is very quiet and introverted. So um, I'm just white, I've been wiped, just completely wiped out. And so I've been pretty much unable to podcast because I have had no energy to do so. Um, I still got some pretty nice dark circles under my eyes. Um, as you can imagine, my sleep study stuff has not been great. 
Um, I actually was sort of falling off the wagon anyway right before. It was like kind of like leaning up to it, um, leading up to the shitty week that I had. Um, and just because it's been hard to face my days. So getting out of bed has been difficult and um, like feeling so, so overwhelmed that I just want to like sleep just to blip out for a little bit. I feel like I mentioned this in my last podcast probably, but <sighs> anyway, it's now that like I can like physically it's feel the difference in my stress level since getting this done. Like by all means, it's not easy street until March. Um, there's a lot of work we still have to do on um, the documentation, like the help guide so that people can actually, when they leave the training, like go and go review in the self-help guide. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but your university, if you go to a university or if you went to a university, actually most univers university knowledge articles are public. So if you go to, let's say, it.umn.edu and you're like, I have a technology question. If it is a university supported tool or product, they will have information on it. So for example, um, there are help articles on YouTube about YouTube. There are help articles about, well, when Moodle was a thing at the University of Minnesota, um, they had tons of articles on Moodle that people in the public would use and like now it's Canvas, but if your company or school uses Zoom, um, which is like Skype, if you haven't heard of it, you can just go to it.umenda.edu and look it up. Like I had never heard of this until I started working at the U and maybe it wasn't as robust when I was in college. And I mean, that was already, already almost a decade ago um, that I finished or that I started graduate school. So it probably wasn't nearly what it is now, but uh, products like I'm sure there's help articles or at least that link out to specific articles for like Google Drive and for um, like Screencast-O-Matic, like any sort of like technology you can try looking up on a university website. And like, I mean, um, I'm, tr ugh, I'm trying to think of it. There's another really big one that uh, Michigan. Michigan, University of Michigan is another one that we um, sort of collaborate with and share information with. So yeah, it's just interesting. Like I had no idea about stuff like that when I was in school, but yeah. Let's get started with um, some of my uh, finished objects. I don't have many for you, but uh, also, tea is in my Maker Mug by Mud and Yarn. Um, I am drinking a lavender stress relief. I, I prefer, because I can only drink herbal teas anyway at night, um, I really like lavenders and chamomile. Chamomile is good, but it has to be with something. Like, it has to be like cut with something. I don't like straight chamomile so much. Um, also, you'll notice I'm not turning my yarn today. My yarn is over to my right. And I just really felt like sitting in my comfy chair with my comfy kitty. Um, okay, so I have two, well, I have one finished object and then one finished object that I have finished more since last time. So let me talk about that. Um, so last time I talked about my um, pink peppercorn shawl by Kalina Nitz or Julia Parlet Carino. But since last time I have added the tassels and pom poms. Now these pom poms are huge. And some tassels. But, try not to dip everything in my tea here. But what I do for this is I tie it underneath here. I'm not going to, but I tie it underneath here. And then I just 
poof it out. And actually, I mean, the palms are really big. Like, I'm pretty sure they're like at least two, two and a half inches maybe in diameter. Um, but I really could not figure out a way to make them smaller. Um, I'm at least following the tutorial that um, Julia uh, provides. And I know how to make pom poms, but like this actually was a really helpful way. It was just finding something that has a circle you can trace on a piece of cardboard and cut out the cardboard and then wrap it around and stuff. Um, it was fussy, but like it was effective, but my pom poms ended up so big and I was so afraid of cutting them too close to the center and having them completely fall apart because pom poms use a lot, a lot of yarn, like so much yarn. And um, so I really didn't want to ruin them. I did, I did end up throwing away one, like I think I only have six poms on here, but uh, she had seven, but they were also a lot smaller. Um, but I ended up throwing like the last one I made away just because I did not have enough yarn um, in it. But I really love it and the pom-poms I feel like and the tassels add um, like a little extra pizzazz to the shawl. So I really enjoy it. I wear this all the time now. Like it's so like big and squishy. It's a worsted weight yarn. Um, this pink uh, and blue uh, speckly boy is traveling yarns in the colorway koi pond and the um contrast color is yeti yarns drop bear dk in the colorway wine about it so this is worsted and this is worsted with um dk so yeah i just wanted to show you like the fully fully finished shawl because i was really excited so i showed it before i was completely done last time My next finished object is what I'm wearing, you guys. Oh, yep, definitely dunked my shawl in uh, my tee because now my shirt is wet. <laughs> so, um, I am wearing the um, Luna Rising sweater by Tina Say. It's my first full size finished sweater. I'm wearing a tank top underneath it because of work, I guess, even though I, I wore a, I wore a, a knitted scarf over the, so you couldn't see like, this is like, what is it? A, I think it's actually a yoga top, but I wear it like a bra. I've also worn it or maybe it's a swimsuit. Oh no, it's a yoga top that I've worn as a swimsuit because it's whatever. Um, but I wore the tank top because sometimes when I'm wearing the tank top, it can it covers more, but for some reason it's like not. And so it's like really useless. It serves no purpose at all because the this um, lace here detail is not revealing in any way. But yeah, I will uh, show you what it looks like. All right, as Dunder Knit would say, um, this is my boobs, <laughs> my sweater boobs. Um, this is the third size, I think, in this pattern. And um, it's three different DK yarns. This top yarn is three Irish girls, um, Springville DK in the colorway um, sleight of hand. This um, second yarn is um, Malabrigo Arroyo in the colorway um, oh, Brujula. And then the final color is um, Haiku Simplicity Spray in the colorway 670 Teal. And so um, as you can see, this pattern starts out with a little bit of lace and some ribbing. Um, goes by really fast. When you're, it's so funny how when you're knitting it, it looks really weird and tall. It does have a um, short rows in the back, and she also adds like an extra like little strip of ribbing, so you can easily tell that it's the back. Um, 
which does not exist in the front. It's like where the rows start and it just has one extra um, strip of ribbing, uh, like narrow ribbing. And um, yeah, so as you can see, the ribbing comes out and then goes back in and then out. So it's got this like really cool design and it ends like this at the bottom. So yeah, it's very, very cool. And then of course the sleeve generally lines up with the body and that was magic. <laughs> um, mine don't, aren't exactly exactly, but they're pretty close. Um, for the sleeves, they are a kind of balloon sleeve that end in a little wrist. So yeah, I'm going to sit back down now. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I had so much fun knitting this sweater. It was, it went by so fast, but I think it's also because I spent like every waking second um, knitting on it when I could. Um, I, the, the striping, like when you're um, doing the sort of fade, it doesn't line up exactly on mine, but that's 100% because one, I didn't realize that the pattern actually was designed so that it would line up between the body and the sleeves. Um, and so I didn't, I wasn't super careful about like, where it's like, you know, do two rows, do two rows, do two rows, do one row, like that kind of thing. Um, I, the way the pattern is written, um, it'll be like, do, yeah, I'm, I want to see there, there's a re it's the way that it is written which isn't a bad way it's just m my attention span way so without giving away anything specific in this pattern like it'll say rows 37 to 40 then it'll say like round 41 and so just because there's not like a huge contrast for the rows I just like would not I would just be like obviously 37 to 40 is four rows that's a lot of rows but like the ones that are shorter like it's a row 37 to 38 and I would just not see the 38 you know like I just wasn't looking all that closely and again it's not it's more of like a font issue than like a her writing the pattern issue um so there's just a little bit of that and that that wasn't a problem with the pattern the pattern was actually very easy to understand um I think there were a few people I don't remember if it was within the test knit or within the regular um pattern who like complained about like not realizing that the ribbing didn't line up but it seemed really obvious to me when I was knitting it like I the ribbing is supposed to go in like a wavy wave uh, and it was very clearly written in the pattern. Like it wasn't something that you were supposed to assume and it wasn't something that you um, had to sort of figure out and make a mistake. Like I don't think I made any major mistakes on this. It was very easy to follow, a very clear pattern. Um, there was something that I did or didn't do on the sleeve and I can't remember what it was. I think it had to do, I feel like it had to do with decreases that I didn't do. Oh, it might have been with switching to smaller needles. I don't think I switched to smaller needles for the wrist because I was worried that it would be too tight. Um, and I'm really glad that I didn't, if that if that is what you're supposed to do. There was something with the wrist, but I don't remember. But I love this. Look at the, oh, it's so, look at how good these colors look together. It's so comfy. I want to wear it all the time. I'm so proud of it. It's my like first real sweater and there's no real big mistakes. Oh, in the body. I made the body longer than the pattern called for, like probably like a full inch. Um, the only problem with the body is that, first of all, I think um, the Simplicity Spray, the Haiku, is thicker than the other two yarns. Um, the Malabrigo is definitely the thinnest. Um, and then, yeah, and then the Three Irish Girls. And so, 
it flares just a little like it doesn't curl but yeah it it kind of flares like I can gather a pretty good handful of it behind my back but also I didn't want it to be super fitted and I am would be concerned that if I like had somehow knit it with less stitches or if I knit it more tightly which I'm a loose knitter um that it would ride up you know like it still wouldn't fit right and it doesn't not fit right now it fits good I think it just makes me look a little wider or maybe it's that like I have um more of an hourglass shape like not a super exaggerated hourglass shape especially right now but um enough where when I wear something that isn't fitted that it just kind of gives me like a boxy shape and I'm definitely not shaped boxy so that's it but it's that's not I'm not trying to go for sexy it's just a cute sweater and look how cute it looks it's so cute so yeah that is the Lunar Rising by Tina Say all right so that's all of the uh, finished objects that I have I do have a couple of whips that I'm working on the first one I want to talk to you about is actually a test knit by um, the Mock Tortoise on Instagram, also known as um, Annette Marie Folkman. Yep, Folkman. Um, she is working on a sock pattern. And I think I mentioned it sort of last time, but I didn't have the test knit with me. Um, so she is, uh, her pattern is called the Mochi Neko Socks and it's named after her cat. So her prototype of her original design is um, black and white, which would make sense because her cat, it's named after her cat, her cat is black and white. And, um, so I, they are polar opposite socks. So the other sock is in the reverse colors. Um, this is the small size and she has made adjustments to her pattern. Um, since this has been knit so I think it looks a little different now I can't find where the second sock is and I'm I think right before the heel on the second sock so this is small it's stretched really tight across um, my sock blocker because um, I want to say let's see how many stitches uh, this was uh, two four it's either 34 or 36 the new one for sure for the small is I think is cast on 36 um and so it is really tight and interestingly it was funny because it was really tight across like here and but it ended way too long and I think everyone who was test knitting for her um, we're finding that there just wasn't a, this looks actually really good right here, but I believe, um, the pattern wants you to do one more set of horizontal stripes, but even in the smallest where I couldn't fit it around my foot, I wear a size six and a half to seven and a half, uh, us shoe. Um, even, even though it was really tight, it was too long, which is really funny. Um, and she's made adjustments since then. Um, this is the first time I've ever done a short row heel, I think is what, no, this is a wrap and turn heel. Is that short rows? Yes. <laughs> um, it was really fast, but I still, I think for me, maybe I should wait until I finish the second one because the second one might actually fit my foot. I do want to knit this in a, um, a size that fits me even if the second sock does not turn out to fit my foot nicely. Um, oh my god, worsted weight. This is the first worsted weight sock I've ever done. And this is pure wool. This is um, brown sheep nature spun yarn um, in the colorways boysenberry, which is the pink, and fanciful blue. But either it's that it's so tight and it's worsted weight, or because it's worsted weight and pure wool, or some combination thereof, but I put on this sock and my foot was sweating. It was like st hugged so tight and it um, was so like warm fibered. 
So it actually was really, oops, I kicked the camera, sorry. Uh, and they knit up so fast, which is great, but then also it's like, okay, so worsted weight, which is very like plump and lush compared to sock weight yarn. It's like, yeah, but are your feet going to sweat to death is the question. So I don't know. Um, we'll see how the second one shakes out. If it does fit fine, then I'll just re-knit the second sock. But if not, I kind of want to make um, a pair that will fit me because they go really quickly and they are really cute. And worsted weight, come on, who doesn't want that? I want I want to see. So I wasn't sure. I feel like with this one that's smaller, um, the heel is really short. Although I guess maybe it's just being stretched out. This side it looks a little longer than this side. I wonder if I missed a wrap and turn, or maybe it's just because, yeah. Yeah, this is what it's supposed to be. That's not too bad. Yeah, that's not bad. Look at how much it keeps its shape. <laughs> um, these are knit on, I think, a uh, size uh, size four for the ribbing and size six for the rest, uh, US. So that's my that's my first one. It's been a fun test knit. She's been um, very like responsive and excited about um, corrections and and um, updates and whatnot. And yeah, so that's the Mochi Neko socks. The second uh, work in progress that I have is a gift for my mom for her birthday, which was in January. But she was supposed to be in not here, the Dominican Republic on her birthday. And um, so I felt like I had more time to work on them. And then work stress made it so that I like, could not, it was like one of those things where like, it was for the first time I kind of understood what people were saying when they said they don't have knitting mojo. It's not that I didn't have knitting mojo. It was just like, I could not wrap my head around doing anything. Even something as simple as, a, as, even something as simple as what I was working on for my mom. So mom, if you're watching this, which I know you are, you should skip ahead. Like a few minutes. Maybe I'll put, maybe I'll find um, where, <laughs> where in this video to skip to but mom if, if you don't want spoilers you should skip ahead are you leaving i am yes okay i'll see you in like 45 an hour yeah probably about that So anyway, mom, skip ahead if you haven't already done so. Uh, my second work in progress is a pair of Wonder Woman socks. So these are self-striping, gorgeous, rich colors um, in the Wonder Woman colorway. I believe it's just called Wonder Woman. Yep. Um, and it is uh, turtle pearl yarns in the striped uh, turtle toes colorway it does come with a contrasting skein of this gold so I did it for the um, cuff in the in the heel but when I got to the toe I felt like either it was gonna be a lot of gold yeah because nice for the decreases so I feel like it'd be a lot of gold and I didn't really want that so what I did was I um, let it do its thing and then I ended up pulling just a little bit of red from a different part like I you know I basically actually I think I took an entire chunk of the next blue out which is fine um and I have enough left where I definitely don't need to start this at all um I've even my mom wears um like a size eight 
women's and I still feel like I'm gonna easily be able to make a whole pair of socks out of just the one. And so these are supposed to be matching. So they start in the same spot, but it's like, it's not hard to figure out where the repeat starts over. So I am on the second sock. on the second sock. I'll spill my tea. So I'm, I'm actually, I think, right, yeah, to start the heel. Um, yeah, I had brought it to a friend's house and then I forgot to bring my um, chow gu straight needles so I could do the heel because I didn't want to try to fussy with um, somehow doing a heel on a size nine inch circular while keeping my uh, stitch, all of my stitches on the same needles. So yeah, I'm really liking them. It's just vanilla um, sock and I, yeah, I really like it. Like my mom really likes Wonder Woman. I've, I've had this yarn for a while and it's always been ready for a gift for her and I just haven't, haven't made it yet. So Happy birthday, mom. I feel like there's like a 55% chance that she just watched this because she couldn't not watch it. Feel free to place your bets below. My last whip is like barely a whip and I feel really bad about it, but I feel like I have a good excuse slash um, story. <laughs> so, I had said that I wanted to make a temperature blanket because I made a temperature scarf last year and the idea of a blanket is so amazing and um, I really want to do that uh, to knit one. But the scarf that I did last year actually came with like a piece of paper that had um, spots to do like the high and the low temperature and like ideally I would have um, a chart set out where it's like the high temperature, the low temperature and um, which colors I would use or like which, at least which range, temperature range that it, um, that those two colors would end up in. So when I was doing my scarf, um, I, in the margins, I would write the temperature. So the way that that one worked was you would write the temperature, but then there, there was a spot, I really wish I had it, this is so annoying. Okay. There were three lines, so three columns per month. And um, the left and the right were the high or the low. So like if the temperature was higher than the um, historical average. So the historical average, average went down the middle column. And they would either write the temperature on the left or the right, depending on whether it was the high or the low um, in comparison. So. I, cause you would change your stitch pattern depending on whether it was um, above or below the historical average. But I, the, I also, and I think actually the pattern did say if you, um, if it was at the historical average that you would um, do just a like stockinette row. And I was like, okay, would it have to be the exact average? So I did it plus or minus two. I felt like within two degrees of the historical average would be the same as average. And so I, what I would do is I would either, if it was above that two degrees or below that two degrees, I would put it within the left or the right column. And if it was um, within that two degrees, I would put it in like either to the left or the right of the number, and then I would circle it. And so then I would know that that is when I would do the um, the stockinette row. And then if it was just the exact same as the historical average, I would just circle it. I wish I was smart enough at the time to realize that I would want to do something similar this year and I would have just made a copy of that because you can't print it, um, at least not the version of that pattern. I don't know when, but at the time that I had bought the pattern, which was about a year ago, um, the pattern wasn't available online at all. You could only get it in person or order it and then have it mailed to you with a copy of the paper. And I assume 
I'm guessing. So it's that you couldn't print out copies, but that seems weird because you could just make copies. I don't know. Um, it wasn't available online. Um, the pattern itself now, I could have, I could link to it, but I guess I don't know if you can print it. And I wouldn't want to rebuy. Like that's the thing. So it didn't come with a Ravelry code, so I couldn't, I can't, couldn't get a digital version of the pattern. And so like I can't print out another one of those papers for this year, which is really annoying. Um, and I, there's just like not a super easy way to get the columns like that. Like you'd think it'd be easy, like just put it in a table or something, but it's, it's just, it's not as simple as that. Because what I want is to have the temperature, what the high temperature was, what the low temperature was, and then a spot for um, what color range for each of those. So what I did on the temperature scarf was after I did my high, low or circling, um, like there was such a small, like a centimeter of space, maybe, might have even been less. Like it was really small margins. And I would just put like, um, I would write the name, well, I'd put the letter of the name of the yarn. So like the yellow, um, what I'm looking at the, the remaining balls of yarn the yellow was called aconite and so I just write an A for aconite and the um orange was like yaffa or yeah probably yaffa um so I put a J next to it um and then one of the the lighter green was called meadow so I would put an M for meadow right and so at least I could know and then because I would like What's annoying about temperatures is you have to wait until the following day to see them, you know? So I would typically wait like a week or several days, um, and then in some cases a month. And then I would just write, so like if it was like uh, the summer, as you remember, if you remember my scarf, um, a lot of August and September were within the, the Yaffa age, range, age, the Yaffa range, which was, an, was orange. And so I would just put J and then put a big arrow, you know, for as many. And so then it was easy to just make, be like, okay, so I have 10 rows of this. <sighs> so all of that story to bring me to, with the blanket, since I don't have a good way to track it, and because you have to wait one day at a time, um, I, uh, I fell behind. I just feel weird, like I want, and yeah, I want, there you go. I fell behind and then I, and then I got super busy with work and then really stressed out and so like I just didn't have the brain capacity to sort of plan and figure out how I'm going to track the temperatures. So all of that to say it is February 7th and I only have five squares done. <laughs> five squares done. So here is my temperature blanket so far. Um, my temperature range was all about the same. I actually think I cheated on this one and uh, one of the squares was supposed to be a sol the solid green, but I was like, ah, I really want them to have contrast colors. And then it turns out all the days in are the same colors here. And so I changed my mind. If it's gonna be solid, it's fine. It can be a solid square. Um, the yarn is a um, combination of Cascade 220, and um, Broco Vintage. So as many of the yarns as I could, I have as Broco Vintage, and then the ones that I could not find a perfect shade for are in Cascade 220, just cause Cascade really has a really wide variety of colors. But the yarn isn't super soft, and I also, they have questionable business practices and beliefs, so I try not to buy so many of them. Um, my stitch marker is this adorable little sleepy little sheep from, um, Simply serving. Look how cute. It's so cute. So yeah, so I only have five days, but I will catch up. Don't worry. I just really need to figure out the best way to track the temperatures and I and then I will I will get to it. So it's just mitered squares. I'm going in a diagonal. Um, I'm not, so it's not going to be tracked as closely as last year for the days. Like, um, someone, uh, oh, um, a young woman at, just a young woman, she's probably my age, like probably exactly my age, 
Um, I think she is. Uh, works at my one of my local yarn stores, and she said that her grandma. She showed me a picture of this. This is insane to me. Um, her grandma knit basically one of these. I don't remember if it was mitered square. I think it was, um, or it might have just been squares. And she has them all tacked up on a board. They just haven't been sewn together yet. And see, that's the thing. I would never, never, never be able to muster the energy to sew everything together after I knit it. Like, no, I, ha I have to do it at the time because I have to see the blanket itself taking shape. Yeah, no, really can't, <laughs> really can't imagine it. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, so she said um, what her grandma did was um, for special days, like anniversaries or birthdays, she would add a, like a Stellina, like some sort of sparkle or something to indicate that the day is special while also doing the weather. And I think that's awesome. So I definitely want to include like my birthday and Steve's birthday and our anniversary. Um, I'm not sure if there's other days that I would want to include on there, like family birthdays or whatnot, but I really think at least those three um, would be good. Maybe the cat's birthdays. Spoilers, they were born on the same day because they're brothers, but still. I think that would be, something like that would be good. Just to, just to like give you an orientation for, for when things are. And it's like really convenient because uh, like our anniversary is in, in May, Steve's birthday's in June, and my birthday's in November, Kat's birthday's in April. So it's, a, it's sort of broken up. At least our birthdays aren't close to each other, which is nice. Yeah, so this is just a minor square blanket, temperature blanket for the year 2020, which I promise I will catch up on. Okay, I do have one more thing. Um, okay, my sock is falling off. Um, <laughs> so, um, Steve and I went to, we're going to a concert in Chicago a couple weeks ago. Um, it was the near, uh, the video game, orchestral concert and um, interjection. It was, the best orchestral concert I've ever seen in person. Um, I didn't even play the games. Like I like vaguely watched them while Steve was playing them, but um, they were really hard to track. And um, I, I probably was knitting, so I wasn't paying as close of attention as I probably normally would. And I still was like incredibly moved by the concert, like, bawled a couple times and like every everyone was crying like it was just a really like emotional concert I don't know um but yeah anyway we had that concert in Chicago so of course we stayed in Madison which is only a two-hour drive from um Chicago and I was so excited about this drive because I knew I was going to finish my my Lunar Rising sweater and that I was going to get to go to South's ear which I will include some footage from South's ear just a little tour if you've never been there um, but I'll get back to that in a minute. And freaking you guys, I we got to Madison and I realized that I forgot to bring my second skein of this yarn. And this yarn is a big, huge part of the sleeves. Like this color, like you can't, I mean, it's like you could use the other colors, but I I wanted to knit it like the pattern. Like I really liked how the colors work together. And so I was like such a child in my heart about it. Like I was devastated that I like had for real, like all weekend was like, I am going to finish my Lunar Rising. And then we get to freaking Madison and this Malabrigo yarn, like you're not gonna just find that anywhere. So I was very disappointed and so when you're at Sao's ear I was like I didn't bring any other project for the weekend because I expected to work on my Luna freaking rising sweater and so while we were at um, Sao's ear I found some yarn for a new project um, that I started so this is the yarn 
that I ended up with, oh, that I ended up with, it is a gorgeous Ogle Design Fiber yarn. These skeins are actually not from the same dye lot, but I don't think it's gonna matter. I'm alternating skeins. So, I remember when Magpie Tendencies came out. Um, I don't remember who it's by, but I remember when that came out, um, everyone, I'll, I'll put a picture. Everyone was so, like talking so much about it, that it was easy, that it was quick, that it was inclusive, and it was awesome. And so I've had it in my library for a really long time. Like I purchased it long before I was even actually considering knitting sweaters. Um, I just thought, oh, that looks easy. Yeah, I can totally do that. Everyone, the way everyone describes it, it looks good. I looked at pictures, everyone knits, um, it all looks the same for everybody. So obviously it's a good pattern, whatever. I don't understand the pattern like at all at all like it makes no sense to me I like the beginning is pretty clever you um do an eye cord and then you're picking up stitches and then knitting um the shoulder straps and then um what you're supposed to do is you connect them and then you work your way down but like the pattern does not, for me, does not at all describe really how to do it. Like it really makes a ton of assumptions about what you understand, what it's trying to tell you. And it says use the chart. Um, inter it's like little, it's like tables that says like, you know, if you're this size, do C5 or some, something like that. See, it doesn't even make sense. Um, let, let me look at it. I struggled with this pattern for hours trying to just get through even the shoulder strap. Um, it's like, I understand what it's trying, it wants me to do, but like, I couldn't even just like BS my way through it. Um, yeah, re refer to panel diagram. Okay, it shows what the panel looks like, um, the schematic. Um, yeah, it has... Again, like not giving away any sort of secret sauce. Like it has like a chart like this and it just says like do A, B, C, D. Like I'm a decent knitter. I have a sweater on, right? Um, at no point during that pattern does it make sense. Even during the written directions, like it just, it has you constantly jumping back and forth where it's like, hey, we, I wanted you to do this this little chunk, like this sort of pattern stitch, but it's unclear, like, does this count as row one? Wait, am I repeating this row one or this row one? Like, it is so confusing. It makes no, no goddamn sense. And I got so pissed off. Like, I wasted so much time and I ended up, I had to cut yarn um, because you do the one strap and then you, um, I think when you get to the end of this strap, then you're supposed, you cut the yarn and then do this strap and then you connect them together. And so I was like, so mad. The begin, the, this yarn is so gorgeous that I was really upset to have to waste any of it. So, um, I wonder if I have the piece that I cut. Let me check. All right. I do. I have it. <laughs> So here's my strap one <laughs> and look at how pretty this yarn is. It hurts so much to have to cut it. It was, I mean, at the end of the strap, it was cut. And then I started, like I had picked up and I had started the second strap, but that I was able to undo from here. And then I'm, I'm using that yarn and the pattern I actually ended up choosing, but this color is so beautiful. And it was so sad to have to cut it. I feel like it, because my light is so close, it's like kind of blowing it out. It's like crazy rich green, Sandra, if you can see that better. It's just like, it's so rich. Mm, I love it so much. Um, yeah, it's an aqua design fiber. 
I'll put in the show notes what what colorway it is. But what I decided to actually start knitting instead because I was going to lose my mind and I kind of <laughs> inside I did. Um, I decided to knit the Yama tee by this bird knit. So I had to find a sweater that used that the amount of brand that I had. And because at the time that's all I had, I couldn't like get a contrast color or anything like that. So I started the Yama tee, which is in my um, Nerdbird Makery um, craftivist bag. So this is what I have so far. So, alternating skeins is annoying. You have extra yarn strings, but yep. I uh, saw so just working on the ribbing um, for the collar. Looks like it's a pearl two knit one or something to that effect. Um, and this is fingering weight yarn. And my beginning of round marker is the Clever Clove a cute little knitting yak. So cute. So that was much better to work on. Much better. <laughs> it makes sense. I And this time I made sure to read through the entire pattern before I started to be like, is this something I can do? And it was. Phew. So that's it for everything that I am actively working on. I do have plans to start several more things, which I'm going to talk about uh, presently, but uh, those are all of the things that I have actually active uh, right now. Um, I hope to be finished with my mom's gift soon and get started on my next sweater. Um, so it is February. February is officially um, like BIPOC make along month, although I haven't I thought it was, but I haven't seen anyone really talking about it. Um, Instagram slash the fiber community is again, a shit show for a lot of reasons. And, um, you know, I think that a lot of BIPOC are feeling like they've, you know, banged their heads against the wall for an entire year and we have reflected and nothing has changed. It's all the same like still racist pieces of shit out there and um harassing BIPOC and blaming them for everything and just wanting to get you know I haven't heard the phrase get back to our knitting recently but that's the sentiment that is being described you know like um peace and love and whatever um you know silencing and dismissing like their lived experiences and so I I don't know if people are just sort of pulling away or um another thing that i noticed interestingly at the beginning of the new year was that um people of color generally speaking people that i follow that i i like and look at their posts every single day um because instagram is my social media of choice um stopped showing up in my feed as much and um the the white people that i follow were showing up in my feed a lot more and that was problematic um, and suspicious so I don't really know what Instagram is doing it just seems like it couldn't have happened on accident especially if Instagram's algorithms appear to make an effort to um, show you people that you follow the most so for example in my stories um, people that I follow the most all show up at the very beginning right like typically speaking and yet they stopped showing up in my feed so i don't know but so maybe there's a chance that i'm just not seeing them um because of whatever algorithm stuff instagram is messing with um but i haven't really seen a lot of stuff about the about a bipoc make along but um i do have several patterns that i plan on working on this month slash i mean over the course of the year the first is, of course, and I mentioned this, the Diaphanous Raglan by um, 
Jesse made Martinson. Um, it is a top down sweater that's knit with that diagonal um, shaping. And I think I showed this before. I want to knit the body. Was this? This is Broco. No. Yes? No. Cascade. Oh, it's Cascade Heritage. Interesting. I didn't even remember that. Cascade Heritage, apparently. Um, it, there you go. It's like a deep navy blue. Um, and I could not find a mohair that I liked. And so I ended up, um, she, Jessie suggested um, for an affordable, because, okay, uh, mohair is really expensive and does not come, a lot of it does not come in um, a lot of yardage. Like even, like, let's say if I wanted a Shibui Knits, I think I would need to buy like six skeins at least. And it's like $20 a skein, something, something crazy for mohair. So um, Jessie actually makes suggestions for affordable yarn within the pattern. And she, she suggested one of them was the Knit Pick Shimmer. So it's just a lace weight yarn. Um, so it's not technic, it's not actually like a mohair or, or even a mohair like, it's just a lace weight yarn. And to be honest, I kind of prefer that. Um, I, sorry. I, um, I really like the... I liked the samples that weren't necessarily super sheer and fuzzy. Like, I love fuzzy, don't get me wrong, but I didn't really want people to see my arms through my shirt as much. Like, you'll be able to see my tattooed arm a little bit because that's just the way it is, but like, it just, when I'm thinking like the sample that was that like light pink sheer and you can just see the arms through it, I just, didn't think that'd be a good look for me. So I, I like the idea of like, I mean, these are really close. Look at how close they are in color. Um, and then when the lace weight is knit up, it'll still be airy. So it won't like really detract at all seeing them being a different color and they're not significantly different in color um, enough where it would be, I feel like super noticeable. So this is Knit Pick Shimmer in, um, oh, color R635. It's a navy-ish. I feel like it's showing up a little more purpley in... Is that better? I can't tell. Um, but it's really close. So I'm really happy about it. I'm definitely going to uh, throw this on the needle soon. So yeah. The next thing that I want to knit just came out. It is called the Elf Mail Pattern and it is by Danny Miga of Danny Knits Things. It is, I think, I want to actually read the description. Um, it's cute. Oh, it's so cute. I will definitely put a picture up for you. It says, it looks like chain mail, but for elves. That's what my husband said when I showed him the first prototype, and that's how the sweater got its name. Elf Mill is a fitted, semi-cropped, I will definitely make it longer, raglan using a broken seed stitch pattern and slipped raglan seams. It's worked seamlessly from top down. Long sleeve version is bracelet length. I'm length. I'm gonna make mine um, t-shirt length, or t-shirt sleeves, yeah. Alpha makes good use of any variegated or speckled yarn that's been sitting in your stash or that colorful yarn you'd love to buy but we're never sure what to do with. Works best with wool blends. Pair it with a matching yet contrasting tonal or solid as your main color. Contrast is key for this design. Um, it definitely reminds me of weaving. So it has the main color and then it's sort of broken up but also you can still see clearly the yarn underneath the um, contrast color. So really excited about that. Not sure what yarn I want to use for it yet, but I have plenty that I could choose from. Um, two other patterns that I want to knit, and these two are also for the BIPOC make along. Obviously, I'm not going to finish all of these things in February, but maybe start a couple of them. Um, is the Duyan Shawl by um, Julia Parlet Carino. Um, 
uh, also known as Colleen on It, and it was her first uh, published pattern, and it is a beautiful shawl. I bought a kit for it from somewhere. I will put it below. Um, it is a dusty lavender and a um, gentle sort of gold and I really really like those colors and um, I have thought about using them in something else but I really feel like they want to be the Julian shawl so I really want to knit that as well and lastly the other last thing I want to um, knit during this month Oh, and those are fingering weight yarns. Last thing I want to knit uh, in this month is the Molly Cowl by um, Shiny Superhero. And I believe that that is a DK weight. So um, it is a really cute cowl. Um, it uses like super high contrast yarns to do a fun design. So um, I think it's like a variegated with a solid. Um, the pattern page picture is like a yellow like a bright yellow and the design is in kind of like a sort of neon rainbow and it is just so cute so cute um i believe you could it's like a dk or you're d holding two fingering weight yarns together maybe a fingering and a lace i'm not sure um either way i'm pretty sure the final outcome is supposed to be a dk so I I feel like I have less started showing um, yarns that I've gotten, um, partly because I get a lot of yarn and I'm kind of feeling um, embarrassed about it sometimes. Just a little. I mean, like, I don't have any other hobbies that I spend a bunch of money on, so why not collect yarn? Um, it was so funny because... My sister came, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but my sister came over um, like a month or two ago, so a couple months ago, and uh, <laughs> like genuinely, like not trying to be judgmental, like genuinely curious, like like um, when she saw all of my yarn, she was like, but why? <laughs> it's like, oh, you don't, you don't understand. Um, like uh, I also recently heard somewhere, I think on a podcast, like, collecting yarn and knitting or making with it are can be two separate hobbies and I can see that I can really see that like I mean especially um indie dyed yarn is works of art I mean really and so I can really see how just having the yarn and collecting it can be a hobby unto itself so like I'm not ashamed but also it does feel sometimes like a little bit of flaunting or like excess, you know? Like I don't feel bad that I have yarn and I don't feel bad that I have a lot of yarn, but I don't feel like I need to spend all of my podcast talking about it. So if, uh, if you're not interested in seeing some um, acquisitions, you can feel free to skip ahead a few minutes, but I just wanted to highlight a few um, purchases that I have gotten. So the first one is um, by Diane Ivy of Lady Di Yarns, and this is a singles. I believe this is for Vogue Knitting Live. So on her Instagram, to me, I feel like I saw more this. So it looked to me more of like a um, black and red and it's see it's more of a black and red and oranges which is fine it just wasn't what i expected um i feel like that's really common with her yarns is like you think you're getting a thing and then what you get is kind of slightly different and another thing is that you order her yarns really far ahead of time and then you get them several months later so then like a lot of like every time by the time i actually get the yarn i'm like oh yeah this is what i'm getting but um I really like to support her and the causes that she um, puts out there. So it's like not a huge deal. It's just always slightly different and a fun surprise. So um, I recently ordered her like mini set for um, Harriet Tubman. So it was only 20 bucks. It was not that, um, not that much for a 
like a hand dyed yarn. And Harriet Tubman, Tubman was one of the most badass people to ever live, ever. Um, like, just like the tirelessness of her action and fervor are like, astounding and inspiring like for real if you don't know anything about Harriet Tubman you really need to go read up on her like it wasn't just like oh underground railroad it's like think about the reality of what her life was like and and what she did for people because it is a lot and it is amazing and it's like us with us with our like cushy lives some of us now like I mean compared to her life I feel like everyone has like crazy privileged lives I mean, it's like she had a TBI at what it was that like as a teenager, even with probably horribly shit medical care and of course, like knowledge and understanding of TBI back then, um, like basically was like, F you all, <laughs> like I'm going to do amazing things and you cannot stop me, which is, she's just so inspiring. So anyway, yeah, I will show the Harriet Tubman uh, inspired yarn when it comes but that was my first thing um the next yarn that I want to talk about is this yarn from a young woman who calls herself ruby and roses um I bought this skein from her and then I bought a skein of um a white mohair but um this is called butterfly kisses um I want to say it's a worsted Yeah, I think it's a worsted weight yarn. Um, it is just this like really like precious, precious, rich pink. Um, I love the little speckles in it. And uh, be believe it or not, this is a 16 year old girl, young woman. Um, and she, this is a very plump, soft yarn. And she recently started a podcast and has <laughs> so many subscribers already. Um, and she uh, has a really nice yarn shop and so I would really like to buy more yarns from her moving forward um, but in the meantime I just bought two skeins of her yarn and this was one of them and I don't have a lot of yarn like this so yeah I have a couple of like kisses yeah ruby and roses yarn the next yarn I want to talk about is a yarn from mud punch um, the colorway is tubular wave and you guys, this knit up looks so good. It's a self-striping, of course, and it has stripes of solids and then that speckle in between, and it is so good. I was so happy to get it. I have so... It's like the problem with my yarns is they're all so good. I want to knit them all right now. They're so, so good. I have so much delicious striping yarn. And I really want to use it all. And I want to use it all right now. Narrow. I'm curious. He's probably going to come out. Yep, here he comes. Um, the next one I want to show you is from Fiber Nymph Dye Works, and this is called Candy Hearts, and it is also a striping. It's like the exact same. Okay, I'm really into the, like, solid stripes with, like, a speckly, um, stripe in the, in, in between. So, yeah, this is called Candy Hearts, and it's so good. It also knits up very beautifully. And last but not least at all, um, yarn from Malia Made It, and this one is called Neon New Year 2020. So this is dyed specifically for this year, and it is a neon rainbow. And um, if you don't know Malia, whenever she sends yarn, she will always give you a set of um, stitch markers in that match the color of the yarn that you got, and it's just like a nice little touch. Um, her yarn is always so high quality. I love Malia's colors and she um, 
auto skeins it up like I mean she does this always for everything you don't you don't pay extra to have her um, ball up the yarn and sh like <laughs> obviously she has technique and obviously people who wind their skeins like this have techniques but I have tried and I end up with a football yarn whenever I try to do this so I'm always really impressed by the balls that I get from her <laughs> and then it did come with a contrasting color I always tell her um, I really like Malia's yarn and I really like Malia and so I always tell her to surprise me with the unless I really care about a color but I typically always just tell her to surprise me with whatever the mini skein is that comes with it so she chose the this lime green for this yarn um I just bought her so she did a little thing where she said hey do you want me not to me specifically but like to Instagram so like do you want me to pick out a colorway specifically for you or something like that for Valentine's Day and um of course yes um please I, I love things that are that are unique to me or especially made for me and so of course I'm like yes please please do other yarn that I've acquired I'm not gonna show but um the Wisconsin craft market, which is like, kind of like a, kind of like a joint fabrics that is a standalone store. I think it was open for like 30 years. Um, like it wasn't a franchise, but it was kind of like a Joann's, but it also had a lot of like local, um, wares which includes actually a lot of indie dyed yarn so their yarn section was actually really impressive and had the whole gamut it was divided up by um fiber weight and it had the whole gamut of um lace weight all the way through like super bulky and they had a ton of yarns just a just a ton of yarns and um they are going out of business the owner is pretty old he the store is located in a basically it might even be basically like a, a defunct mall like it might it might even be the last store in the in that mall um and i and like the owner said that he had been looking to maybe move to a smaller model and have a store open elsewhere but then he decided like okay i'm getting i'm old i think he's like like 68 or something like I'm retiring age basically I don't want to sign a whole new lease on a whole new place and I don't know I guess he didn't want to give operations over to someone else um although he might have said too I guess maybe that like some of the main workers have been with him for a long time and so they're also kind of older um but I mean that store like as I said it's also kind of like a joint so it has a bunch of little things all over the place like I used to work at Michael's when I was my uh my one year that I lived in North Dakota and I remember people would ask me for the most specific things and it's like there's so much random crap at stores like that like random crafty crap like like obviously someone needs it but it's like I would never know that this existed and in this area you know uh, just like I'm just thinking oh, so many little tiny things so that's what this store had um, but anyway point of the story is is it's going out of business they don't have any sales yet for the going out of business they're just like operating as normal until um, until um, April I think um, but they had like a real selection of um, uh, is it Broco folio yeah, I think so. Um, and I am currently knitting a tank top by Paper Daisy Creations, um, Lisa Ross. Wait. Yeah. Um, out of out of their out of folio, and I, I've shown it on the podcast before. Um, yeah, Cityscape. Yeah, Lisa Ross. Just making sure. I thought so. Anyway. Um, and so, but everywhere that I find folio, every store only has like two skeins of each color. And like, why? The yarn is so good. And 
I discovered that the craft market had like entire bins full of this yarn. And so I was able to find a sweater's quantity and I might have gone a little overboard, but it's really cheap. It's not that expensive. Um, I bought eight skeins of this like lavender and it, all of the folio colors are, are shimmer. They, they're they like really soft, airy, and they have shimmer. And I bought eight skeins. So I, it's like, I want to say it's like 1400 yards. It might even be more than that. Um, of this yarn so I cannot wait to knit something with it and I was so excited to be able to find eight skeins in the same dye lot it was really nice okay. so the last of the acquisitions that I want to talk to you about are stitch markers and so I will show you these stitch markers I got. The first ones I got are from Simply Serving. Um, I ordered this adorable little snow fox. Very, very cute. And then for the fires in Australia, I think she ended up donating it to wires, but I ordered a limited edition little kangaroo mama with her baby and it oh and it has a little heart on it And those are from Simply Serving. Um, and for a little while, um, she, I don't even think I ever saw this in her shop, but she um, was, she gave out additional stitch markers, um, a surprise uh, to get, to like clear out her inventory along with orders. And so I got this little sock, which is really cute. It's like textured, like ribbing. And then the other two is a new to me person. Um, her name is Whitney Anderson, and she has started making small batch um, stitch marker heads, mostly, in addition to a bunch of other things, but um, specifically what interests me is the stitch markers, um, with UV color changing hair. And the colors are really vibrant, and I wish that I could show you, like it's nighttime, it's like... 10 o'clock, <laughs> 10 o'clock at night. Um, uh, so I can't UV show you, but they are of people of color and they include, um, I first heard of her from um, Kalisha of uh, Quirky Monday Crafts, Nadir Tani, but um, Kalisha was really excited because Whitney made stitch markers with, um, I wanna say um, locks, like L-O-C, locks. Um, but yeah, anyway, hairstyles that aren't just my hair, right? Um, I, they, she uh, makes a variety of like really on point skin colors, um, that range from like a light tan, um, all the way to a like dark brown and they're all super good. Um, I hesitated to buy any. Um, I I do really, um, as I've shown before, really like um, like Latin X um, um, products um, be because of uh, my own Mexican background. But I also really appreciate um, other other people of color. Um, I like to other people of color items. That's what I mean to say. Um, I really like to norm, normal, like help normalize. Like you know, it's it's really that whole same thing of like how come? I mean, emojis are a really big example. How come emojis basically represent just white people, and that's the normal thing that you see, and then only people of color have access to some emojis of color um or like um i mean for me and my sister we we um we had barbie dolls that weren't just the white girls 
Um, but I think the only dolls of color that we had um, were like, um, we had a Scary Spice doll and, and a doll that was Japanese styled. Um, she came with her hair up with um, like little Japanese um, beads in her hair and a, a kimono with an obi. Um, I believe that she was actually, I don't know where she came from, but she was actually like a doll, not, um, she, she reminded me of um, like a skipper Barbie. Like she had a teen style body and, but she had a big head and like def definitely disproportionate. Um, reminds me more of like an anime character but she, her face wasn't super exaggerated in any way. And, but that was basically it, right? Like Barbies are generally white people. Especially when my sister and I were kids, there weren't a, a variety of Barbies. It was mostly just like tons and tons of white ones and then maybe like a black one occasionally. So we really liked, <laughs> we really liked playing with not just the white girls, you know? Um, so even, um, Victoria Beck, Victoria Beckham, I don't remember what her name was before she was Beckham, but, um, I mean, even her skin as a Barbie was like more tan and her hair was, I mean, her hair was straight, I guess, but it was a different kind of straight from a traditional Barbie. Um, like I, maybe it was because it was short. It was actually like mine, I think, um, Anyway, the point is we liked variety of Barbies, right? Like we didn't want things to look exactly the same. So I like the idea of um, like waiting, first of all, so that people who like BIPOC who want items that represent themselves, like mm, Kalisha's so precious. Like, you know, like she gets to actually buy something that looks like her. Um, I, I want to make sure that like people get to have the things that they want, that I'm not just the white girl who's buying all of the um, all of the things that BIPOC want. So anyway, point is, is I waited until um, her stock got low because she only does small batch things. And um, then I was like, I want, I will buy um, a couple of the really cute, cute, cute faces. So um, I bought blue and pink and it's like a, honestly, it's not that different from the sock that I'm knitting. It's like a rich uh, sea blue and then um, like a, like a rich magenta, like maybe not as boysenberry as uh, my sock, but but pretty pretty pink. Um, but you can't see it because it's UV only. It's their their hair is definitely UV. So um, oh my god, ah, this is the first one. I think I mean the lights are super reflective but and then the second one I really love their facial expressions like like I think I, bu I bought two that have actually really similar or maybe even the same facial expression but there's a variety of facial expressions given and a variety of hairs like look at this cute little hair So yeah, you should definitely check her out. Um, she's if you just start typing Whitney W H I T N E Y um, Anderson into Instagram, I'm sure her her Instagram will pop up. Um, she has other things too. I think she's releasing a crochet doll pattern, um, among other things. So super cool. Really happy to support. And one more thing I want to show you really quick that I just remembered that I got that's just been sitting in my lap is this cute little like sewn bag from Fate's Thread. So I bought a couple, I, I bought a few things from, from her, um, but I thought, oh my god, I'm going to come back to this in a second. Um, these are just one of a kind like little things that she was doing and it's like, oh, cute little Game Boy adorable with a cute little 3d heart she also had um like ones that had little pokemon stockings on it very cute um so you should check her out 
I bought these. These are size four and size sixes. These I bought for my test knit and then I could not find them. And I thought I was like, did I, did I not buy them? Like, did I only think I bought them? Um, I bought them from Darn It anyway. Um, but I was like, did I, did I think I bought the nine inch circs? So and then I ended up actually buying the 40 inch cause I recently bought. Um, so I had an Addy, I think it was an Addy, um, whatever the one with the blue cord is. Um, I have two 40 inch Addy turbos in a size four because that's a really common, um, needle size and length for shawls. And I like, can't stand them. Like I, I hate them. Um, the, I bought the one and I used it and I hated it. And I was like, well, maybe it's just this specific one. So I bought another one and I hated it. Um, the join is just really bad. The, the way that the, um, cable like bends, like you're just constantly fighting with it when you're trying to push stitches up over the join onto the needle just irritates the crap out of me. Um, so I'm, I bought a chow goo because darn it was selling them or it might've been sousier. Um, uh, sells them and so I am going to try that and see if it's like is it the length of the cable is it the cable type I don't know we'll see but I thought that I, I could not figure out where those the, the nine inch circs went and I really prefer nine inch circulars for um, socks and um, on my test knit I feel like the especially with a worsted weight yarn and with only a few stitches the like gap where the row changes is like really intense. So I wanted to see if I could make that better by having, using a nine inch. So, yeah. While I was sitting here, I remembered something super important that I need to talk to you guys about. I was talking about Darn It and that reminded me, talking about Darn It and that reminded me, oops, hit the camera that sorry about crinkling they um recently had a retreat that featured amy of la Anime, and um then they were having a like pop-up of her yarns and um she is french and buying yarns from the uk is very expensive to ship here and so i and her yarns are like the top of the luxury yarns in terms of cost i shouldn't say that not the top <laughs> okay um yarns from knit circus are are really expensive too um but they are they're pretty high right like if you think um general indie um indie dyed yarn starts at like 28 probably maybe 24 I feel like 28 probably um maybe 26 and then like I start thinking that like the 30s like thir um, um Labi Anime is, is 34.50 I think um I mean that gets expensive really fast and then Knit Circus um they do really specific gradients and they run anywhere from like 34 four to 43 per skein depending but they also though they their yarn usually is more than 400 it's usually like 430 they also sell skeins up to like 600 ingredients so but those skeins also are probably more expensive anyway um lobby anime i was so excited i got an email that they were like hey we have yarns from her would you come buy it and I was like, absolutely, I want to, let's go. And so after work today, Steve and I drove over to Stillwater and um, spent a long time looking at her yarns because it's like, I couldn't buy that many skeins because wow, expensive. Um, it just adds up so fast. And I didn't have an idea in mind because I only heard about the yarn today. So I didn't have like the time to like think about and plan and whatever. Um, but I ended up getting two skeins of her yarn um it is merino super socks 75 percent superwash 25 percent nylon 
and actually it's the Rhinebeck colorway. It says Otomne a Rhinebeck, so I assume like Rhinebeck Autumn, um, something to that effect. And it is, it's like a gray with speckles. It's slightly darker than the camera's picking up. Like, I feel like it's more of a a cooler tone gray. Um, like, almost like a very, 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 very light purple. But it's not. It's definitely gray. But it's definitely not a warm gray, even though it has some warm colors on it. Oh, I have to go because Noah and Steve are here. Maybe I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. They gave me an ice cream sandwich. We were talking about how we like don't eat ice cream that often. And the last time we had ice cream sandwiches was actually when, when we did 90s Gamer Weekend. <laughs> was that in the fall, summer? I can't remember. Um, anyway, really quick, I, I'm just, I need you to understand the amazing complexity of this yarn. So I just like really want to just like, Like the speckles are just so good. Okay, enough with that. <sighs> so that was nice. Um, now I'm officially done with yarn stuff. And also, I apologize, I don't think so, but there is a not zero chance that I have, like, ice cream sandwich, whatever food alike that they <laughs> um, make the, like, what even is that? Brownie, chocolate, edge, what, whatever edgy, whatever the buns are in an ice cream sandwich. I feel like that stuff could stick to my teeth. <laughs> okay, life stuff. Uh, try to get this ugly thing out of the way. Um, so I talked already about my work stress a bit. Um, so it was really bad um, the weekend before everything went live. Um, I had just overwhelming anxiety, so I just needed to like just be alone and not talk and not do anything. And, um, but I was just like, you know, feeling really, um, heightened and just like, like, honestly, I would describe it as like a panic. I was just like, really just like, just a straight up, like alarm emergency feeling mode. And Steve was like, Hey, I have a suggestion since you can't focus on anything else. Like I tried yoga and I tried breathing and I tried, um, whatever. I couldn't sleep away the weekend. Um, he said, why don't you read? Like the only thing that I can like truly tune out and forget about everything is with reading. And it's like, wow, what a genius idea. So I was like, okay, so I have two days. What should I do? It was really, was it two days? Did I start it on Saturday? I think I did start it on Saturday. Um, I decided to read um, a Haruki Murakami book. So I decided to read this, I think came out in 2017, no 2018, yeah, it just came out. Um, so the pronunciation of this, uh, the dictionary says it has a long E, so killing commentatore, no, killing commentatori. It sounds weird in, in, in American English when I, just to double check, played it with a European accent, it sounded so much more like natural but yeah killing commendatory um i mean it's commander basically right um and i this was such a good book for me um if you've ever read haruki murakami generally his characters are not super memorable they're pretty samey from book to book it's almost like <laughs> 
almost like he's rewriting the same book in a bunch of different ways. And I mean, I'm easily entertained. I just want to be in a world. So I, it doesn't bother me, but I know it does bother some other people. Also, all of his books leave you with a bunch more questions. Um, this book was particularly good for my situation because it like did not want to be hurried. Like I'm a, I'm a pretty fast reader. I finished that whole book in a weekend and it has 681 pages in the hardcover version. Um, I definitely feel like I could have read it faster. Um, I'm thinking like the seventh Harry Potter book I read in a day. Um, but like this book, you could not just like force it by reading it faster. Like it really wanted you to like leisurely take your time through it, which I think was super good for like my current mental state at the time. Like I needed something that was like going to calm me down and not like escalate me any more than I already was. And so um, that was like really nice. Like I have a lot of really good feelings about that. Um, just being able to like stroll through the book, just go on the journey with it. Um, nothing like super serious happens. Um, it just, it felt like a very gentle book and I, I was really happy to read it and I finished it. So, um, and I was able to make it last basically the whole weekend. Um, I finished it at like almost nine o'clock at night, I think on Sunday and then spent the last couple hours like trying to watch like an easy show, but it was kind of rough. So if you like Haruki Murakami or if you are interested in getting into his works, I think this is a pretty good book. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read Japanese authors before, maybe you might have a little bit of um, objection to some of the content in there, but it's not like, it's definitely not worse than Stephen King. And I love Stephen King. Like I've, two full shelves dedicated to Stephen King. So, um, yeah, it was good. I've also been getting into doing more yoga. Um, that's been really good. Um, definitely something that I need. I've also been trying to play more ITG. Um, and just having fun with it. And food wise, I have been having a lot of fun um, using recipes from uh, the Blue Zones meal planner online. Um, they've got some really good recipes that are just like whole, um, whole foods, simple in that it's like you can, you have a bunch of pieces of ingredients and you put them together, but like you can, um, recombine them in different dishes and, um, even, <laughs> interestingly, even though like it says um, like you can, it's like you can pick sizes of meals and so I have a medium and a large and then I always click leftovers so it doubles the recipe and it always ends up making at least for us five, even though it's not supposed to have a lot of calories. And so either, I mean, I also tend to like use more veggies than anything calls for because why not? Um, but then that means more leftovers, which is great, because then I can just, if I run out of, like, <sighs> like, if I run out of noodles for a recipe, but I still have several of the veggies left over, I can just add those veggies to something else, or I can mix the whole thing with something else, and they're just really flavorful and, um, and good, so. There was some, one recipe that I made, and, like, it was, like, a homemade, um, tomato sauce, which is, I shouldn't say homemade. It's not completely homemade. Like I have definitely like when I used to do um, Blue Apron, um, you'd make like a tomato sauce completely from scratch. Like you'd take tomatoes and cut them up and then just simmer them for like 20 minutes until they turn into, into a tomato sauce. This is a tomato sauce made out of diced tomatoes, like already diced canned tomatoes, um, whatever. But it this recipe said to um, just cook it for whatever, you know, and I was like, tss, tss, uh, I'm going to take it one step further and I put it in my Vitamix and I, um, you guys, for expensive, um, like kitchen appliances, 
of Vitamix is so worth it. Just so worth it. They're so versatile. I use mine all the time. I've had it for four years. They have a lifetime warranty. Um, yeah, they're just, they're so good. But anyway, I put it in, the, in my Vitamix for a while and that like took the sauce to like a whole new level. And um, it was called like something like pizza something. Um, which it was I thought was really strange and I, I was like there's no way it's gonna taste like pizza it's like lentils and um, like what is it it's called creamy polenta with pizza fixings and veggies now listen to the ingredients in this green lentils uh, I used French green lentils I don't know what the difference is but um, Whole Foods was out of regular green lentils they only had French green lentils so I really liked them. Maybe, maybe that's why I like it so much because they're fr they're like probably slightly different than regular lentils. But I tend to find um, regular lentils like really starchy and like, you know, like very pasty. I don't know. Um, but the French green lentils were really good. Um, polenta. It's a polenta cornmeal. I did not pay attention to that at all when I was at the store. <laughs> I just bought one of the tubes of polenta because that's what I know polenta as. Um, uh, diced tomatoes, basil, oregano, spinach, nutritional yeast. I use nutritional yeast, but then I also, because you bake it for a little while, I added, um, I grated some cheese on top and pumpkin seeds. That's it. That's all that's in it. Lentils, basically a homemade tomato sauce, and polenta really and um and the nutritional yeast and we put cheese on it i can't tell you how good this was and how crazy it tasted like pizza like it obviously didn't have the texture of pizza but like um i wonder what it would taste like with just it being polenta cornmeal and not just i mean like solidified polenta. I mean, you put it in the microwave and then it mashes up just fine. But, um, you put the microwave. Oh, for reheating. I was like, I didn't put it in the microwave. If we reheated it, um, it, yeah, it was so good. I'm definitely gonna make it again. Like, delicious. Um, other meals we have made are, are we, well, Steve helped me. Um, some soba. I used a combination of like true buckwheat soba. So like real buckwheat soba, like the best soba noodles are, um, they're, God, they're a hundred percent buckwheat and they're like two to three times, like two and a half times more expensive than if you buy the soba that is wheat flour and buckwheat. Um, so I just combined, like I used it, it called for 10 ounces and soba comes in um, packages of eight ounces. So I used one full package of the buckwheat soba that I already had. And then I had bought um, a second pack of the cheaper, less pure soba. And that, you know, it's with um, uh, broccoli and um, edamame and um, it's like a, a ginger a ses no a ginger miso sauce and again I put it in my Vitamix and it, it's really good um, there's like a sorry if you can hear my cat drinking water um, we did a ravioli soup oh my god so I have made smoothies for years in a variety of different ways but one of the ways that i would make smoothies would be to put like milk almond milk or whatever whatever plant milk and um and like oats like they say like you know put oats and frozen fruit etc peanut butter in a in the blender in the vitamix but like i just never really felt like it was as good as i wanted it to be and I found that the secret is, is you like need to, you need to soak the rolled oats overnight. So what I've been doing is I, um, soak rolled oats in whatever plant milk, 
Um, I use regular milk too. Um, although I would recommend whole milk in that case because it's like nice and thick and creamy. Um, you soak them overnight and then you then you put them in the blender and so then the oats are already plump and you um and so what i've been doing is i put them in the blender so it's like um two cups of oats three cups of milk um i split this between me and steve um some peanut butter like a serving each of peanut butter um a little bit of maple syrup a banana and then I was doing frozen raspberries, but then it ran out. So then I did frozen strawberries and did I say banana? <laughs> you probably don't need the banana, but I threw in the banana because our banana, we don't, I don't like um, super ripe bananas. Like I don't want them under ripe, of course, but like, I don't want them super ripe. Like they, they get too sugary, like they're mushy and they're just like, like too much. So, um, I was putting them in my smoothies because they're perfect for smoothies. But yeah, um, oh, they were so good. And I have found that I can really keep hanger at bay. I might have talked about this on a different podcast, but I can keep hanger at bay if I have a good balance of carbs, fat, and protein, which for me actually ends up looking like a, what they call a high fat diet. But it's not high fat. It's like the like the default suggested like breakdown of macros is fifty percent carbs, thirty percent um, protein, and twenty percent fat. And um, in the high fat version, it's thirty percent fat, thirty percent protein, and um, forty percent carbs. So you're just taking ten percent away from carbs and then adding it to fat. And like, I'm not officially tracking any of that, but I, but what I am doing, I mean, I was for a little while just to like get like an idea, a handle on things. I was just using my fitness pal and like just tracking macros. Um, like I just bought a couple months of premium and um, got a handle on like what is a good breakdown of, of the three macros. Um, but yeah, I, I found that just adding a bit of fat to my meals, just finding a way to put in some sort of fat. So whether that's peanut butter, I also use regular, like really high quality butter, um, olive oil, um, avocado, like any way just to make sure that you add fats. Um, I mean, some some other nuts too are primarily fat. And so just just making sure to get the balance with the adding protein and adding fat to your meals, which I really struggled with when I was vegetarian exclusively, um, was getting enough fat in my diet. Enough. Maybe I struggled more with protein. Like, don't get me wrong. There's definitely protein in plants. It's just that you need to eat a lot to get, like, the equivalent amount that you can get from a really small amount of meat. So, um, yeah. It's been, it's been really, really good. And I've been hangry so much less. And when I start feeling hanger coming on, I've been able to satisfy it so much faster than um, before when I was just sort of eating whatever. Like now when I'm like really thinking like, oh no, I'm starting to feel hangry. I probably need some protein and some fat. I can um, really quickly like eat a good balance of, th of things. Like I could eat a piece of fruit with a little bit of beef jerky or I could eat, and, and by beef jerky, I mean turkey jerky, come on. Um, or like even like a spoonful of peanut butter and a banana, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, or um, actually what I usually do is a spoonful of peanut butter and an apple you know, so I don't know if you, if you feel hangry a lot like me, um, that doing something like that has been really, really helpful for me. I know this is getting super long, but I don't care because it's my podcast. Um, we've been spending time with friends. Um, like we said, like Noah is over for the weekend. Um, and we're just going to quietly, well, they're going to play games and I'm going to knit all weekend. 
and um, they just um, did their Game of the Year podcast stuff um, last month. And so you should go check out the video, B-I-D-E-O, on Spotify. It might be other places, but Spotify for sure is where it is. Um, yeah, so to, to hear what they ended up with for their top uh, game, for their games of the year. They also, they did categories and then also like, uh, I think it, I think a top 10. I honestly, like, there's a lot. <laughs> Their podcast is like, even though it's only like three of them in this episode, I still like get it confused with all of the other games of the year podcasts I listen to, which I think speaks to how well they did. But yeah, if you're interested for the games of the year for 2019, you should go check out the video. But yeah, they're going to play games and I'm going to knit. And um, so yeah, we've been spending time... We've been, we've gone to Noah and and our other friends a couple of times, and then we've also gone to our other friends, um, Nick and Scott, so, um, several times. Nick just bought a house in the fall, summer, um, and we've all been watching like um, a, a good amount of Brooklyn Nine Nine, and I never saw it when it was out, so we're going through it right now. And we've also actually been watching a decent amount of Superstore, which is on Hulu. It's just like really, really easy watching. Like it's silly and it's just like a, hey, we work at a store that's definitely just a Walmart alike. Um, it gives me a lot of vibes. Like if you ever saw um, Adventureland, the movie with uh, Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart, um, I worked at an amusement park for four years, uh, four summers, and, um, because, it, because Minnesota, um, and Adventureland felt so much, like, obviously it took place in a slightly older era, I think, um, slightly older, and so, like, you get away with more than you could in, in, when I was a teenager, but it felt so similar, like, and I bet people who work in retail, um, and I've, I've worked in retail, but only on, um, only as a temp, like, for holidays, that's not true, I don't know why I think that, <laughs> I, I don't know why I said that, that's, like, not even close to true, I've worked at JCPenney, I worked at Michael's, I worked at Bath and Body Works, I worked at GameStop, um, just not long term. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. It's because it's just never. I've never worked at a place long term, um, like that. Like no more than a year, um, each. So and the, and what I I think the reason why I said that was because most of the half of those jobs were um, seasonal, or um, second jobs, not like my primary job. But I met. But I've never. I didn't. I mean, J C Penney is still not Walmart. You know. Um, in terms of working so um anyway i bet that people who work in retail at a place like walmart will give high like yep those are the vibes <laughs> those are the antics that you get into you know so it's it's very easy watching um and it's it's decently funny but, um but brooklyn 99 is like so good it's it's it strikes a really good balance between comedy and like real issues does not strike a good balance between how cops generally behave. Like they, they do address like issues with police forces, but I feel like a lot of it is tongue in cheek. Um, but they do address like issues within police forces, like profiling and, and stuff like that. But I just mean like the way that they arrest bad guys is super unrealistic. <laughs> Like, always guns drawn, always, you know, freeze on my PD, you know. But, but that's, like, not the focus of the show at all. It's more about the relationships, of course, because it's a comedy. Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, tomorrow, I've got some family, uh, some family thing for someone's birthday in my family. And sun, no, next Sunday, 
we're going out we're going out with Steve's parents who will be visiting um, from up north and Steve's dad just had a birthday and yeah and I think we're, we're pretty quiet for a few months like we were in Madison um, a couple weeks ago as I said because um, we were going to the concert and um, we ate at Sow's Ear and um, I will give a tour just because it's like it's a it's a coffee shop yarn shop or it's like a cafe yarn shop and it's just so cozy and it's like a renovated house I think maybe people live upstairs um, but it's just like a cute little cozy place I don't typically actually end up buying a lot of yarn from there but I love we I always eat at their cafe and I always love to look at their yarns and I've taken a couple classes there so I'm gonna put a little little tour video in there for you. So I'm in Sauzier. I'm gonna just get a little bit of footage of the Sauzier. It is a cafe yarn shop in Verona, Wisconsin, and I just bought some yarn to knit the Magpie Tendency. it's cool and it's like my ultimate dream to open a shop exactly like that <laughs> um, probably different selection of yarns and like I can't believe a place like that does not exist here don't steal my idea I call it <laughs> but yeah I should get going so I can go hang out um, if you are a, a new viewer thank you for coming and uh, if you're a returning viewer, so happy to have you. If you don't subscribe, please subscribe. Um, I'm at like 90-ish. It'd be awesome if I could get to 100. Like that's like, like I'm not obviously like clamoring to be like, oh my god, I want to be a big YouTuber. But like a secret goal, like a hidden goal or whatever has always been like, I think 100 is nice. That's a good number. So, yeah, please subscribe. <laughs> and until I see you again, bye.